I am not, I am not Fred Talishi. Uh, Fred, Fred couldn't make it and he asked uh, me to step in. So my name is Michael Hoffer. I'm one of the neurotologists at the University of Miami. Um, and it's a pleasure and honor to do this session. Um, these speakers only have four minutes and they're gonna get cut off at four minutes by the people in the back who also wanna cut off my microphone every 10 seconds. Um, and and um, there's no time for questions, but I'm supposed to encourage you, any questions you have, go to the poster session, because that's what they're highlighting. So without further ado, um, our first presenter, uh, Olivia Adamson from Iowa, Online Auditory Training Index for Cochlear Implant Professionals and Users. Hi, so yeah, like you mentioned, I'm Olivia, um, and me and my mentor, Julie, are very excited to share our project with you about an online auditory training index for CI users and professionals. Um, I have no relevant disclosures. Um, my mentor, Julie, is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Iowa. Um, so just some background, um, cochlear implants provide a degraded signal compared to natural acoustic hearing. Users often have a hard time learning or relearning those speech sounds through their implant. Um, auditory training has been shown to improve their speech understanding, their ability to hear a noise, as well as their appreciation of music. CI audiologists and related professionals often are not reimbursed for providing auditory training, and they often, as we all know, do not have adequate time due to other priorities during their appointments, like mapping, programming, and device care and use. Um, and there also is a lack of evidence or research supporting one auditory training method over another. So the purpose of our project is to provide an efficient way for hearing professionals and CI users to select appropriate auditory training resources. So how do we do this? Um, first, we compiled available auditory training resources that could be done independently by the patient or with a communication partner. We did this through Google searches, smartphone applications, um, as well as reaching out to CI manufacturers about their resources. And then we categorized these resources. We had about 35 of them on different features. So what platform are they on? Are they on a smartphone or a website? Or can we print them out? What skills do they go over? How much do they cost? As well as what age are they appropriate for? We then created a user-friendly website, which I'll show you next. That's the exciting part. And then we're going to share this website with CI audiologists and related professionals. So. Our website, so there we go. On the right there, I'm sorry if it's a little blurry, but you guys can type in that URL there and check it out. Um, it teaches you how to use the website, why it's important to do auditory training. Um, and then you can also go to the resource page, which will list all the resources as well as a short description of them and what skills they go over. Um, on this next slide here is a little video that walks you through how to kind of go through our search tool and pick certain criteria. So how old is our patient? Let's say we have an adult. We want it to be on an Apple device. Uh, we're gonna practice phonemes, words, or maybe environmental sounds, so kind of those basics. Um, and we want it to be at a beginner level, and we hit submit. And then it populates the six auditory training resources that meet that criteria. It also has like important banners, information that you should know about that resource. You can also click the More Info button, and it'll give you a link to the App Store or to the website, so you can directly access it that way. So in conclusion, auditory training is a very important part of cochlear implant users' success. Um, we should be recommending auditory training to CI users regardless of their age, skill level, or length of implantation. Um, this website can make the selection process more efficient and less overwhelming for both you as audiologists and for the patient. Um, and we'll continue to monitor feedback received on the website, search for new resources, and update that website accordingly. Um, so feel free to scan that QR code, come visit me at poster110, type in that URL, go to the website, explore it, check it out, fill out that survey, and give us some feedback so we can continue to update it and make sure it is the best. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to visit me on my poster as well. Thanks. Our next presenter is uh, Paulina 
Lamanier, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, cochlear implant and tinnitus, a prospective cohort. We have to wait for the slides to come up. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pauliana Lamonier. I'm from Brazil, and I'm going to talk about tinnitus in patients undergoing cochlear implant. Uh, the results of a prospective cohort, I have no disclosures. And the objectives of my research was to evaluate the impact of the cochlear implant in the perception of tinnitus, and also analyze the relationship between duration of hearing loss, effective duration of hearing aid use with the speech recognition test after cochlear implant surgery. So our sample was made up with 30 patients with bilateral profound hearing loss who were candidates to cochlear implant surgery and complaining of tinnitus. And it was a prospective cohort study with the application of two questionnaires, the THI, Tinnitus Handicap Inventory, and VAS, Visual Analog Scale. And these questionnaires were handed out in four different moments, preoperatory, seven days after cochlear implant activation, three and six months after surgery. At the preoperatory, the patients filed out the consenting form and demographic file with information regarding etiologies, hearing aids use, comorbidities, and surgical features. And the THI and VAS were handed out at the four phases of the cohort. We performed the speech recognition test at six months after surgery. And the VAS values were dichotomized from mild to moderate, VAS less than five, and from moderate to intense, VAS greater than five. Also, we performed with the THI, with THI less than 47, mild to moderate, and THI greater, greater than 47, moderate to catastrophic. The surgeries uh, were performed by two surgeons, and the mean hearing loss time was 25 years. The mean time used in hearing aids was uh, 15 years. And the speech recognition test for sentences was 86%. And for two syllables was 69%. The most of the patients had uh, unknown uh, etiology of the hearing loss. And uh, the surgery, most of the surgeries, uh, the, insert, the insertion of cochlear implant was complete and by round window. And we didn't find a statistical correlation between the duration of hearing loss and uh, with the speech recognition test and the time of hearing aid use with the speech recognition test. And we also didn't, we didn't find a correlation between THI, VAS, and the speech recognition test either. Regarding the number of cases, uh, we, we have uh, an increase of the number of patients being classified as mild to moderate regarding VAS, and we uh, also find an increase of the number of patients being classified as mild to moderate regarding THI. Regarding odds ratio, uh, we, we find an increase of the number of chances of the patients being classified as mild to moderate. Also, we, didn't, we did find, we find uh, an increase of the number of chances of patients being classified as mild to moderate. At six months, the patients had 5.21 greater chance of being classified as mild to moderate and not to moderate to catastrophic. And the tinnitus improved after cochlear implant surgery based on THI scores, and this improvement was statistically significant. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Our next speaker um, is Hazim Yunus, CCI Cloud, a framework for community-based remote cochlear implant users experiments based on the CCI mobile research platform. Say that 10 times fast. Okay. <laughs> Azim is not here. John is not here. Okay. I can guess we can go on to the next one, please. Um, so now our next speaker is um, 
Jacqueline Eberhard, utility of a pitch ranking task in the individualization of filter frequencies to improve sound quality and performance a case study. And that was a little bit easier 10 times fast. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for that introduction. My name is Jacqueline Eberhard. I'm a rising third year audiology student at the University of North Carolina. And today I'll be presenting a case study related to the pitch ranking task. Just to go ahead and orient everyone and get us all started, I just want to remind us how pitch information is delivered to cochlear implants. So as we can see here, we have apical contact one that's located deepest in the cochlea, extending out to contact 12 that's located most basally. For most cochlear implant users, a stimulation to electrode contact 12 that's more basally located elicits a higher pitch sound compared to the more apical contacts. <laughs> However, this is not the case for all cochlear implant users. Some users experience what's called a pitch reversal. And this is when you stimulate that more basally located contact. However, it actually elicits a lower pitch sound. And stimulation to the more apically located contact stimulates a higher pitch sound. What our team was most interested in is when you identify these reversals, how can we make individualized mapping changes um, and results in the settings to um, account for these pitch reversals and potentially improve sound quality as well as speech recognition performance in challenging environments. We can do this by the pitch ranking task. This is a two alternative force choice task that's completed by simultaneous, or excuse me, sequentially stimulating adjacent contacts and then simply asking the patient which resulted in a higher pitch sound. There are three possible outcomes for this task what's called tonotopic, which is when you stimulate that more basally located contact, it does indeed elicit a higher pitch sound. Non-discrimination, meaning that they were unable to tell the difference between the two pitches, or a reversal, as we mentioned earlier. The case study that we are presenting today is of a 71-year-old female who received a 28, or flex 28, excuse me, array from MedL, and we identified reversals on the most basally located contacts. For MedL, this is E10, 11, and 12. Individualized mapping choices were made with the goal of improving sound quality as well as providing discrete pitch information for this patient. Acutely, they reported much uh, improvement and clarity in the sound quality. They returned to the clinic three months later and we were able to see an improvement in their speech recognition, particularly for CNC words and quiet, we see a modest improvement here. However, when we look over at um, AZ bio sentences and spatially separated noise, we see a much more convincing and uh, statistically, or excuse me, significant improvement when you have the target speech in front and that competing speech presented to the contralateral ear. In conclusion, we do think that this supports um, high clinical utility of the pitch uh, ranking task, as well as support for making those individualized mapping choices for cochlear implant patients to improve perceived qu sound quality as well as their performance in spatially separated noise. I would like to thank uh, my team at UNC and my mentors for their support. Um, without them, this work would not be possible, and I'd be happy to expand upon this case and answer any questions later this afternoon at the poster session. Thank you. Our next speaker. Um, Dr. Toledo is from the University of Miami, a development and utilization of a cochlear implant test protocol for Portuguese speakers. We kept the Portuguese angle part of the field. <laughs> All right, so like Dr. Hoffer said, my poster is the development and utilization of a cochlear implant test protocol for adult Portuguese speakers. The need for this protocol emerged when I started back at UM in 2020. A colleague approached me about a patient that spoke Portuguese that had been previously evaluated and determined to not be a CI candidate. When I did a chart review on that patient, I realized that her testing had been completed by an English-speaking audiologist using a Portuguese interpreter translating Spanish test materials, and I thought that surely there would be a better way. So 
does a protocol already exist was my first question. So I started doing a little bit of research and I did find a publication from 2004. It outlined a really comprehensive testing protocol for patients with severe to profound hearing loss. But when I compared this protocol to the English minimum speech test battery, the per Portuguese protocol was testing a lot of different modalities, but really not giving any information about how the patient performs in real life situations. So luckily I have a family member who's an ENT at the Albert Einstein Hospital in Sao Paulo, and he put me in contact with an audiologist from the CI program there. She sent me their current testing protocol, um, which is for the evaluation of profound hearing loss. So in looking at both of these two protocols, I still felt like it was giving me a lot of information, but not any information about how the patient does in noise and does not fit with our indications of normal to profound hearing loss. So the protocol that we implemented at UM is for patients with normal to profound hearing loss. It includes ear-specific aided functional testing with warble tones and ear-specific words and sentences in the auditory-only condition. Um, for sentence testing, we decided to use hint sentences in Portuguese in quiet and in noise. Unfortunately, the Portuguese hint has the same limitations as the English hint in that there are sealing effects. And so another limitation of us using the hint is that it needs to be administered in monitored live voice I know a recording exists somewhere, but I've not been able to locate it for purchase. So I was also informed by the Brazilian audiologist that they're awaiting a validated version of the AZ Bio in Portuguese, but that's also not been released. So when that's released, we will definitely change our protocol to include it, but for now, I have to use what I've got, which is hint sentences in monitored live voice. Um, which there is actually a benefit to that, is that I can use any noise that I want for the testing, and so I can use the AZ Bio speech babble in English. Um, this does make sense for these patients because even though their primary language is in Portuguese, their day-to-day -day life is surrounded by English. All of these patients live in the US, they're always around English-speaking noise, um, and as my colleague, Dr. Sanchez, presented in a previous session, we know that the speech shape noise used with the hint traditionally is just not difficult enough to shift the patient performance from the ceiling when it's presented at zero degrees azimuth. So the choice of noise was definitely that AZ bio speech babble in English. Um, for the 700,000 Portuguese speakers that live in the US, um, this just is the most realistic way to test you know, how they do in their day-to-day -day life. For word testing, we decided to use recorded bisyllable words. I know that bisyllable and monosyllable wordless exists in Portuguese, but the only recorded materials I could find is bisyllables. And so to try to eliminate as much variability between testers and clinics, I did use recorded materials when possible. And so a big shout out to my Miami team and Dr. Holcomb for being my mentor on this project. And then you feel free to email me if you have any questions or come talk to me at the poster session. And once again, do, do remember that uh, these are all posters, so please uh, spend more time with these wonderful presenters at their, at their posters. Um, returning to um, Dr. Lamanier, I had two, two chances, I butchered it both times probably. Uh, cochlear implant quality of life evaluation based on a prospective cohort. So, my name is Pauline Lamanier, I'm going to talk about quality of life in patients under undergoing cochlear implants. It's the same sample, so I'll get more time. I have no disclosures. And the objective was to analyze the impact of cochlear implant in the perception of quality of life. And the same sample. And uh, for this research, we performed uh, the application of four questionnaires, HADS, who call brief, IOICI, and GBI. And these, and these questionnaires were handled at four different moments as the same as my, uh, of my last uh, work. And the HUCO brief and HADS were performed at preoperatory seven days after CI activation and three and six months. 
the IOICI just uh, was handled at three and six months, and the GBI just applied at six months after surgery. And uh, for HADS, we also dichotomized uh, into anxiety or depression, HADS greater than nine, and no anxiety or no depression, HADS less than nine. And descriptive measures for hucol brief, IOICI, and GBI. The surgery, uh, the surgery results were the same of my last presentation. And regarding the number of cases of anxiety and depression, we had a decrease of cases of anxiety and depression uh, during the follow-up at three and six months. And about duration, we saw and decrease of the number of chances of these patients being classified, being uh, diagnosed with anxiety, and, uh, and a decrease of the number of chances of these patients being uh, classified with depression. But that results were not uh, statistically significant. Regarding the GBI, the objective was to evaluate the improvement in quality of life, and we, we found an improvement with positive values. Regarding the IOICI, most of the patients were satisfied with the cochlear implant. And regarding the five domains of who call brief, the physical domain, uh, we have a decrease of quality of, light, of quality of life at seven days after the CI surgery, with an increase at three months and a worsening at six months. And for the other domains, we found the same results with no statistically significant. But with the, in the environment domain, we found a decrease in seven days after the CI activation with an increase at three and six months, and these values were statistically significant. We also find statistically significant f significance for the self-evaluation of quality of life and for general domain. And uh, our, our important data that we found that uh, except the self-evaluation of quality of life, the other domains showed a worsening in quality of life at seven days after the CI activation. And it, it, may great, uh, it may point to a greater need to adjust patients' expectations regarding rehabilitation time and uh, to show the patients that hearing and comprehension will appear with times of speech therapy and uh, auditory training. So. We, we found um, a decrease in uh, the diagnosis of anxiety and depression after the, the cochlear implant surgery, but the values were not statistically significant. And we also find an improvement in quality of life regarding IOI and GBI. Thanks a lot. This is Goiânia, the city that I live in Brazil. Our next presenter is Dr. Jennifer Cotto, a parent beliefs and experience with genetic testing for children with sensory neural hearing loss from the University of Miami. Thank you, Dr. Hoffer. So I will be presenting on parent beliefs and experiences with genetic testing for children with sensory neural hearing loss. So these are my disclosures, and this study was funded by the NIDCD. So the benefits of genetic testing have been well documented with studies showing that those who have a genetic hearing loss have better cochlear implant outcomes. However, genetic testing is not the standard of care in audiology and otology practice. So our team decided to look at the reasons and the barriers for lack of utilization of genetic testing in a pediatric sample. So we surveyed 146 parents of children with hearing loss from our audiology and otology practice and also from social media groups of parents of children with hearing loss. So we created this questionnaire de novo, and it's called the Parent Perception of Genetic Testing Questionnaire, and it has 44 items, and it assesses parent perceptions, decisions, and satisfaction with genetic testing. So our sample consisted of mostly non-Hispanic white mothers with an average age of 30 to 39 years, with some college or above. Children had a mean age of seven years old, most wore hearing aids and had a congenital hearing loss, and most had private insurance. 
So what did we find? So in terms of utilization of genetic testing, 78% of our families reported having insurance coverage for genetic testing. However, only 47.6% actually underwent genetic testing. Out of those, 52.5%, their cause of their hearing loss was identified, and in 11.6%, they didn't even receive the results. 44.8% didn't undergo genetic testing at all, and we wanted to see some of the reasons why. So the highly endorsed um, reason for not undergoing genetic testing was that it was never offered. And we thought this was kind of interesting because in our own clinic, we do have a geneticist on our team. So we decided to look at our data just within our clinic and outside of the social media group participants. And we also saw the same pattern that the most endorsed reason for not undergoing genetic testing was that it was never offered to them. So next we wanted to look at parent perceptions about sharing genetic testing results. So 42% reported using these results to make decisions about family planning. 81.1 were willing to share results with their child when it was time. And most of the samples shared results with their relatives. When they chose not to share the results with their relatives, some of the reasons they cited was negative findings, privacy, or lack of family interest. And those who did decide to share cited reasons for sharing as awareness, family planning, and family concern. So we also looked at experiences with genetic counseling, which as you can see, there's room for improvement. So 55% did not receive counseling before, and 58% did not receive counseling after. Also, 40% of the families had a significant delay in receiving these results. For those that did receive counseling, most parents were pretty confused with the information provided, and only 43% remembered what they were told about the mode of inheritance. When we asked families, how do you want to receive these results, they said that face-to-face -face was the best method, and they wanted results by someone fluent in their own language. When we asked who should give them their results, it was pretty much providers that are typically found in our practices, so ENT physicians, audiologists, audiologists or geneticists. So overall, parents of children with hearing loss reported being open to genetic testing. However, significant barriers still remain, such as low referral rates and cost. Audiology and otology practices should integrate genetic testing into their standard of care. As we saw from the data, pre and post testing counseling is less than optimal, with families either being confused or not remembering. And genetic counseling is a very crucial part of our evaluation, so it should be done face to face and in the family's preferred language. Future research is warranted to help ameliorate some of these barriers and improve access to genetic testing and counseling for patients with hearing loss. Shout out to my team from the UM Hearing Implant Program, and thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Our last uh, presenter, Samantha Schraff, uh, influence of MAP settings assigned with behavioral versus objective measures on the monaural and binaural hearing of adult cochlear implant users with asymmetric hearing loss. That is the champion longest one. <laughs> So my name is Samantha Scharf, and I am a clinical audiologist at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'll be sharing um, a project we did um, looking at the influence of MAP settings assigned with behavioral versus objective measures on the monaural and binaural hearing of adult cochlear implant users with asymmetric hearing loss. And here are our team's disclosures. So the two aims that we had for this study was first to characterize the relationship between the electrically evoked stapedial reflex threshold and behaviorally measured maximum comfortable loudness, or MCL, levels. And then our second objective was to compare speech recognition with maps created using ESRT or behaviorally measured um, MCL levels for cochlear implant users, specifically looking at uh, those patients with unilateral or asymmetric hearing loss. So for our first, um, our first aim, this is looking at a cohort of 66 cochlear implant recipients. Um, all were implanted with a Medel lateral wall array. And so you can see on the x-axis, we have each of the electrical contacts within the internal device um, from the most apical range up, up to the most basal electrode. Um, and the blue uh, bo box plots represent the MCL levels that were derived behaviorally. And then the gray box plots are the ESRT values on each electrode. And the trend that we observed is that the behaviorally measured MCL levels were higher than the ESRT values. And our second aim was looking at the effect that this um, has on speech perception. So this analysis um, was created with a cohort of 10 cochlear implant recipients, all with unilateral or asymmetric hearing loss. 
um, and they were tested first with a familiar map which had been created with behaviorally measured MCL levels and then um, acutely with an ESRT created map. They were tested in three um, in, uh, AZ bio sentences in a DBSNR of plus zero in three um, configurations. So uh, speech front noise to the contralateral ear, speech front noise front, and speech front noise to the cochlear implant ear. Um, and you can see the percent correct score on the Y axis. And so the um, familiar map again was in blue and then the ESRT map is in gray. And we observed um, higher uh, speech perception scores on this task in the um, ESRT map. So to summarize, um, we did observe differences in the MCL levels um, assigned via behavioral measurement versus ESRT. Um, and overall, behaviorally measured MCL levels did tend to be higher than ESRT values. And our preliminary data showed better speech recognition and noise for cochlear implant users with unilateral and asymmetric hearing loss when they were listening to maps with MCL levels assigned via their ESRT as compared to their more familiar uh, map which had been created behaviorally. And some future directions are to assess the differences in MCL levels across these different mapping procedures in a larger cohort of patients, and then to also assess these differences in performance, again, specifically looking at unilateral and asymmetric hearing loss with a larger sample of cochlear implant recipients, and to compare whether the performance differences we observed um, are maintained after long-term listening experience with the ESRT map. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm just going to announce the poster numbers uh, for everyone so you can know where to go to talk to these wonderful people. So for, uh, do, for uh, Dr. Toledo's poster, raise your hand, Dr. Toledo, number 45, Dr. Cotto, number 140, uh, Jacqueline Eberhard, number 43, Samantha Shaft, number 23, Olivia, raise your hand, number 110, I'm not going to go even for the first name for, and butcher for a third time, but uh, <laughs> our wonderful Brazilian colleague. Uh, and we have Portuguese speakers in, in Miami, so I, sh I shouldn't butcher it. Uh, number 273 and number 270. So please take the time to visit these wonderful folks and give them a round of applause.
Um, I have the honor and privilege of introducing the keynote speaker for this afternoon, uh, Dr. Ferenc Bunta, um, which I got to meet actually last year at this meeting uh, at the Cochlear Implant Conference and excited that um, hopefully in the future we have some projects in collaboration moving forward. Um, but Dr. Bunta has been a faculty member in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of Houston since uh, 2008, so 2008. His research focuses on bilingual and cross-linguistic speech acquisition in children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants um, and their peers with typical hearing or speech and language um, delays. His work has been funded by NIH and NIDCD, the Department of Education, and the Spencer Foundation. He's also the founding director of the PhD program in communication sciences and disorders at the University of Houston. Uh, today, he's going to be talking about uh, speech and language production of bilingual children uh, with cochlear implants and highlighting um, many different areas and clinical implications. And directly following this keynote address, we also are going to have a panel, um, Cultural Linguistic Considerations in Non-English Speaking Patients or uh, Individuals with LEP, for those of you that attended the earlier session. Um, and that's going to be moderated by Dr. Alejandra Uliari. So please make sure to stay in your seat because this will go to 345 and then directly after we will also have um, the panel. So Dr. Bunta. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction uh, and uh, thank you for coming to my presentation. These are my disclosures and sometimes the universe hands you clues. Um, so this morning this just happened. Uh, I was having my coffee, and uh, uh, the person who was the cashier also had a foreign accent. Obviously, I have one, so uh, she asked me, what's your name? And I said, Frank. I usually say Frank because if I say Ferenc, what happens, I get names like uh, uh, Vernac or FedEx is my favorite. So, But that aside, it got me thinking as I was standing there, like, here we are, uh, two people who are obviously bilingual in different languages. So, so that got me thinking, and it was very timely because it just happened this morning, uh, thinking about when communication breaks down, and I'm not Jackson for the record. So when communication breaks down, there's always some answer and there's, there's an explanation that you can find. So hopefully today I'll, I'll be talking to you about how uh, and what to look for when you're analyzing the speech of bilingual children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants. So I want to introduce my, after my introduction, my second introduction is that bilingual individuals are not two monolinguals in one. And bilingualism itself is not a speech or language uh, disorder and it doesn't cause one either. And uh, the degree and pattern of communication disorders is not different from monolingual and bilingual children. That is to say that bilingualism doesn't exacerbate speech or language disorders. So with that aside, as uh, many of you as surgeons, clinicians, researchers are interested in the question, can bilingual cochlear implant users learn how to communicate into spoken languages? And I have to emphasize during the speech, I'm talking about spoken languages. There are other forms of bilingualism, like sign language and, and another language, but uh, I'm gonna focus on spoken bilingualism. And the short answer is yes. Now, if you wanna qualify that question and ask, can bilingual children match the uh, skills of their monolingual peers uh, with hearing loss who use cochlear implants? The answer to that question is also yes, assuming that they get home language support. And then the question becomes, is dual language support better or worse than English-only support uh, for bilingual children with hearing loss who use hearing aids and cochlear implants? Because there's this feeling out there like, child already has a, 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 a hearing loss, should we confuse them by introducing a, uh, another language? And the answer is, uh, you don't really need to worry about that too much because bilingual children with hearing loss do better when the home language is supported as opposed to when they get English-only support. And then you're probably wondering why that is. Uh, the simple answer is more language is better than less. And if the family uses the language other than English at home, then encouraging more language use is simply better. And um, 
then as a clinician, you're probably wondering, well, should spoken bilingualism be supported? There's evidence in the literature showing that if family support exists, that's helpful. If there's uh, the home language is other than English, then yes, uh, supporting that language is generally beneficial. And if there's a worry that, well, what's going to happen uh, if my child or you know, my client, uh, uh, we teach them too much of the other language, will English suffer? The answer, the quick answer to that is eventually bilingual children either tend to become balanced bilinguals or in most cases actually English becomes the stronger language over time. So that worry is really unfounded, uh, both from a science and from a clinical point of view. Uh, recently, uh, my friend and colleague Annie Castillanos published a study uh, looking at now how can bilingual children with hearing loss maintain their home language and what we found is bilingual children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants can indeed maintain their home language, but not at the same level as their bilingual peers with normal hearing. And we also found that maternal education had an effect on home language maintenance in that uh, uh, there was a difference between cochlear implant users and their peers with normal hearing. So I'm gonna show you the figure, one of the figures from that paper. Um, on the vertical axis, you see percentage of Spanish items maintained. This was based on uh, a year sample. So we had a sample at the beginning of a year, and then we had a follow-up uh, about 11 months later. And uh, uh, how many items did they maintain? This is just a raw measure looking at the preschool language scales um, administered in the dual uh, language mode. And what we found was that, indeed, there's a difference between cochlear implant users and their peers with normal hearing, but the biggest source of that difference seemed to be coming from children whose uh, mothers didn't finish high school. Of course, this needs further attention, but this was a very recent finding that came out of our lab. Now, because my training is mostly on phonology and uh, speech science, I'm going to show you some very specific speech patterns that I know a lot of you will hopefully find interesting and valuable. So I'm gonna present a few studies, uh, three or four, uh, and the first one is looking at segmental accuracy and whole word variability. And I'll explain these terms and how, we're, uh, how we were using them in a minute. So this was a study we published with Ana Sosa in 2019. We looked at speech production measures such as percentage of consonants correct spoken. Uh, so. Uh, I know I have to emphasize that uh, because some of you may be thinking perception. So here I'm looking at spoken language, percentage vowels of cor uh, correctly spoken, and whole word variability, and I'll explain that in a minute. We had both Spanish and English samples, and we had monolingual and bilingual children, as well as children with uh, hearing loss who use cochlear implants, and their peers with normal hearing. In terms of segmental accuracy, a most common measure that you'll see is something like percentage of consonants correct. That's a rough measure of how well a child approximates the adult target, how correctly are they producing their consonants overall. And uh, I'm gonna give you some examples of accurate and also inaccurate productions. So the first example you'll hear is by a child with a cochlear implant who's bilingual saying the word sheep. Maybe not. Sheep. Let me try again. Sheep. 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 Oh, I see. Someone's messing with the presentation. That's okay. Can you do the second one, which is sheep by a child, bilingual child with normal hearing? Sheep, sheep, sheep. Thank you. And the third one is going to be an inaccurate but consistent production of sheep by a bilingual child with a cochlear implant. Uh, so go ahead. Sheep, sheep, sheep. Now you can probably hear the substitution there. So for the fricative, you have uh, an affricate substitution. All right. So uh, in terms of results. Looking at the English results for uh, monolingual and bilingual children, we found that there was an effect of uh, hearing status. Children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants were less accurate than their peers. I, I don't think that surprises anyone. However, we did not find an effect 
of monolingual versus bilingual uh, uh, participants. Now, when we compared the English and the Spanish samples of the bilingual participants only, again, we found an effect of hearing status in that children with hearing loss have lower accuracy rates. And we also found a language effect in that the Spanish consonants tend to be, tended to be more accurately produced than their English counterparts. Now, looking at variability, and here I have to be careful about uh, um, defining variability, I mean that producing the same word at different times. So, for example, if you have a child say cat one time, cat a second time, and at a third time, then it would be uh, all three variable forms, so then variability would be at the max. If someone says cat, 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 variability is uh, at the minimum. Even if they mispronounce it, but consistently, variability would be low. So can I ask you to please click on the fish, the first fish, which is an example from a child with hearing loss who uses cochlear implants? Fish. 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 And let's do the next one. Fish. Fish. So you could hear the same child producing uh, uh, the same word differently at different times. And oops, there we go. So for whole word variability in English, when you compare monolingual and bilingual children with normal hearing and children with hearing loss, again, we found an effect of um, a hearing status. And here you have to remember that the higher number is uh, more variable. So the more variable, the less stable it is. And children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants are more variable than their peers with normal hearing. So they, they are, tend to produce more uh, different forms for the same word. But we didn't find any monolingual versus bilingual effects. Of course, this is something that we need to dig deeper because we only had 10 participants per cell, so we probably need to uh, do a follow-up study on that. When we compare the Spanish and English productions of the bilingual children only, again, we find that uh, children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants are more variable in their productions than their peers with normal hearing. And we also found a language effect in that the Spanish samples seem to be more stable and less variable than the English ones. The second study I'm going to talk to you about is, uh, uh, gets a little more, uh, uh, gets a little deeper into the speech science part. So looking at voiceless fricatives and affricates. Uh, specifically the voiceless alveolar, like sh as in shoe, and the voiceless palatal, uh, sorry, voiceless alveolar as in su, and the voiceless uh, palatal as in shoe. And uh, my colleagues, Fang Fang Li and Bruce Tomlin and I did uh, publish this study in 2017. In English, we had s as in su, sh as in shoe, and ch as in chu. And in Spanish, we had S as in sol and ch as in chango, for example. Uh, we didn't have uh, the palatal fricative because the dialect spoken by our participants didn't have that in their inventory. We had both bilingual and monolingual participants, children with normal hearing and peers with hearing loss who use cochlear implants. And uh, we looked at a, a number of factors. I'm going to highlight two of those. One is frication duration. Now, uh, many of you, so bear with me, I'll, I'll, I'll explain the difference. When you have something like shu versus chu, the sh in shu is about twice as long. We're talking about 100 milliseconds versus 50 milliseconds, roughly. So that's a very salient, robust feature that the cochlear implant can transmit fairly well. And therefore, Differentiation was correct in both English and Spanish in that the standalone fricative was about twice as long as the fricative portion of the affricate. And this was true for all groups, monolingual, bilingual, normal hearing, and hearing loss with cochlear implants. However, when we look at spectral mean, spectral mean is a feature that gets transmitted less well by the implant. So we're relying on features like uh, uh, you know, anywhere from two and a half kilohertz to about eight or nine kilohertz, uh, if you look at the range of going from the S to the SH. And the spectral mean frequency seemed to be a feature that children with normal hearing differentiate much better than their peers with hearing loss who use cochlear implants. 
and the distinction between alveolar and palatal fricatives was less clear in the speech of children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants than their peers with normal hearing. And I want to highlight that on some of these slides. This is also in the paper, so if you're uh, interested, you're welcome. I'm happy to share it with you, or you can look it up. If you look at the spectral mean overlap by uh, children with normal hearing, you could see that both bilingual and monolingual English-speaking children separate their alveolar versus palatal fricative affricate fairly well based on spectral mean. However, when you look at the cochlear implant group, both bilingual children and monolingual children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants show a lot less separation based on spectral mean along this dimension. The final study that I'm going to present to you and then I'm going to wrap it up with some uh, clinical highlights and implications is syllable complexity and word length effects on segmental accuracy. Uh, this was a study we presented here, uh, well not in Dallas, where was it, uh, D.C. last year at the ACI meeting, we had 40 Spanish and English speaking uh, bilingual children, 20 cochlear implant users, 20 children with normal hearing. We investigated the effects of hearing status, language, word length, and syllable complexity on consonant accuracy. And what we found was that all of these factors, hearing status, the children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants were less accurate, which is by now not a surprise, probably. Uh, language, uh, Spanish tended to be uh, somewhat more accurate than it, uh, English. Word length, three syllable words tended to be less accurate than one or two syllable words, and syllable complexity, so something like strikes versus cat. Uh, there was a, uh, an effect for that. I think what's even more interesting is when you look at the interactions, bilingual children with cochlear implants were more affected by syllable complexity than their bilingual peers with normal hearing. And the more complex the structure, the larger the difference appears to be between cochlear implant users and their peers with normal hearing. Uh, and I'm gonna highlight that on the next two slides. So I'm gonna show you an example both from English and Spanish, starting with the English. When you have an item like duck, what you see is, yes, there are differences between uh, the accuracy rates of children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants and their peers with normal hearing, but you have 88% accuracy in cochlear implant users, 97% accuracy in children with normal hearing. However, when you compare that to something like a screwdriver, which is obviously a somewhat more complex word, um, you see that both groups are affected, but cochlear implant users are more affected than their peers with normal hearing. So here they are highlighted. And I'm gonna play a sample. So um, go ahead if you wanna click on the duck first. Duck. And screwdriver. Screwdriver. So there you go. Now I'm gonna show you the Spanish sample, uh, something like pan versus sombrero. You see that, that the story is even more impressive there because you have 94% accuracy for cochlear implant users versus 98% in this, on this particular item. And when you present a more complex item, the children with normal hearing in their Spanish samples uh, diminish only by a few percentage points. However, children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants show a lot more considerable effect. So, there you go, you see those side by side. Can I ask you to please play them, starting with pun? Pun. Sombrero. All right, so I'm gonna wrap it up with some uh, findings and uh, implications for clinical practice, starting with repeating the fact that bilingualism is not a speech or language disorder, nor does it cause or exacerbate speech or language disorders. As a clinician, you want to look out for cross-linguistic effects and be aware of differences between disorder versus difference. Because sometimes, like, uh, um, some elements may be overlapping. Uh, for example, if, and, and this could be any other language, if it has consonant vowel structure, then uh, past tense or even uh, 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 plural or uh, other morphemes may be affected. So, um, 
you have to differentiate that and be aware of those differences, regardless of the language. So you have to have some awareness of what your client's home language is. And uh, I'm not saying that you should go out and learn every language possible, but you have to have do your due diligence in looking at, uh, um, at the home language patterns a little bit. Bilingual children with hearing loss can achieve speech and language skills commensurate with their monolingual English-speaking peers who have hearing loss and use cochlear implants and hearing aids. Home language support may improve overall speech and language outcomes. So supporting the home language, if there's uh, uh, um, family support and the language used at home is, is non-English, it actually can benefit not only maintaining that home language, but supporting the English. So that is something that you may want to keep in mind when you uh, um, do your assessment and uh, treatment. The cochlear implant signal properties affect various uh, aspects of speech differently, such as duration versus uh, spectral mean. And these result in unique speech production patterns in all children, but especially children with uh, uh, hearing loss who are bilingual. And uh, in my understanding, there are other languages that are even more affected, for example, uh, languages of China like Mandarin and, and Cantonese where you have to uh, uh, take into account uh, additional factors. The phonological structure of a word, so when you're using your assessment and you're using your Goldman Fristo or whatever you may be using, consider the structural complexity because the more complex an item is, the more it seems to tax uh, the abilities of children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants who are bilingual. And the diminished signal provided by the implant interacts with the two languages differently. Therefore, language-specific effects may be expected and definitely need further inquiry, which is something we're working on. And I want to end on a positive note, saying that providing a language-rich environment at home, regardless of the language, has overall benefits for language development for bilingual with children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants and hearing aids. And, um, and coming to the end of my presentation, if any of you can figure out how Frank becomes, uh, what was that? Yeah, <laughs> then let us know. Because there has to be an answer. And I want you to take this away that, that there's always some explanation. So uh, uh, it's worth looking deeper into what those patterns are and how you can best help your client. With that said, I want to acknowledge NIH and IDCD, American Cochlear Implant Alliance, Rebecca Gonzalez, Michael Douglas, the Texas Hearing Institute, especially Jennifer Wickersburg and Amy Cantu, my participants, parents and teachers, and Arturo Hernandez and Mario Svirsky for their invaluable input on earlier versions of this presentation. Thank you. <laughs> I finished too early, you want your money back. He did such an amazing job that he answered all his questions during the talk, so. Thank you, Dr. Gunther. There we go. I just had a question about the, um, the findings that the bilingual CI users did better in Spanish than they did in English. And I'm wondering, is that an effect of their home language? Were the majority first language Spanish users? That's a great question. There are multiple factors. So yes, probably the fact that uh, in the first few years, well, I'm a parent. So when you, you know, your kids are one to three, you're their superstar. After that, things change. So, <laughs> so you know, these are six-year-old kids, so there may be some of that effect. Also, I want to emphasize effects of the items used, because sometimes when you have translated, I, now the word list that we developed took a few years, but they were developed from scratch, individualized for the language. So a lot of translated and uh, uh, let's say transposed, transformed exams are not really designed for the language. So, so I think some of the differences come from that, if that makes sense, uh, and also 
phonemically, so from a speech point of view, the uh, phonological patterns, the, the phoneme inventories are uh, uh, not, there are fewer fricatives, for example, in Spanish. There are fewer consonant clusters, so the structure of the language is different, which may increase the percent consonants correct. But I think, yeah, designing tests, and this will be critical going forward, from scratch rather than translating it will, will be important. And I have a feeling that's going to yield different results. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I'm John Ogilai from USC. Uh, qu two questions. One is, what kind of home support do you recommend for uh, bilingual uh, homes? And then secondly, can you extrapolate any of these findings to adults where English is not their primary language? Yes, so I want to give a shout out to the Texas Hearing Institute here because uh, they have developed, and, and Michael Douglas, if you're here, uh, and Jennifer Wickersburg and Amy Can too, uh, that uh, uh, supporting it both in, uh, in a therapeutic setting, uh, if it's possible at school, and then sending home assignments and then working with the parents uh, together. And of course, like there was a presentation earlier today showing that having more bilingual speech language pathologists would go a long way to, to evolve them, and then you can uh, uh, give homework assignments with parents, as well as do uh, like one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions once a week with the child. So uh, I'm sure the Texas Hearing Institute and, and I can tell you more about it. Now for adults, it's the same. The principles are the same. I, I didn't start learning English until I was 17. So there's hope. And the reason I got into phonology was because uh, First thing, I'm, when I open my mouth, obviously, I say Frank and they hear Jonathan. So, uh, so it was Jackson. <laughs> it, it's, it's really about that, that speech system that I believe is malleable almost, you know, from cradle to grave. Now, is it as malleable later as, as earlier? No, but uh, supporting the whole language will be helpful because just having more exposure and more training is, if nothing else, brute force itself and, and providing that support will yield benefits for kids, adults. Uh, there's no downside to it. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not like, well, I'm going to overload the, well, they already speak Spanish at home, so the kid's going to hear it. If you encourage the parents not to use Spanish, they're going to have, you know, either not talk to their child, which is not a good strategy when you want to encourage language development in general. Thank you.